Are we ready to go? Okay. Ready? Okay, good morning, Caltrans planners and colleagues. Welcome to the second talk in our series, Planning for the 21st Century Emerging Trends. Today we are going to hear from Professor Louise Mozingo. She is Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning at UC Berkeley. Before we uh, go into the introduction, let me just add that these sessions are being webcast for the convenience of our viewers statewide. So this recording will be archived on our division website, Division of Transportation Planning. And also that we are having, a, uh, we're noticing that we've got viewers from all over the world coming in and looking at our archive videos. So we feel uh, very proud that we are positioning ourselves as a leader in inviting great thought leaders and providing uh, the latest planning information to a global audience. Last month we had our first session on bike and pedestrian issues in transportation planning. And we had over 50 uh, participants in person here at Caltrans and um, also 100 viewers online. We had a great presentation and a lively Q&A session. And we look forward to such great participation from the audience today as well. Those online, please submit your questions by email, which is uh, listed, the, the address is listed on the flyer. I want to thank very much the staff from UC Connect at UC Berkeley who um, helped us bring um, Professor Mozingo here today and also to staff in the Division of Transportation Planning and Division of Research and Innovation here at Caltrans who are helping us to arrange our series of planning for the 21st century. The title of Professor Mozingo's talk today is The Challenges of Suburban Office Landscapes, Understanding the Past to Re-Envision the Future. So you might ask, why landscape architecture and suburban office landscapes? Well, I happened to listen to Professor Mozingo speak on Bay Area Public Radio recently on the topic of a huge office space expansion proposal by Google in Mountain View. The innovative park-like design incorporating movable glass canopies that would be open to the public as well as house the company was fascinating. And it brought about discussion of the impacts on housing, jobs, and traffic in Mountain View and the region. The radio discussion among local city council members, Professor Mazingo, and callers from around the Bay Area touched on the issues we are all grappling with at statewide, regional, and local planning levels. How do we promote economic growth while creating livable, sustainable communities that provide for work-life balance, jobs housing balance, more transit and connectivity, sea level rise and environmental adaptation, and preservation of existing communities, all the while reducing single occupancy vehicle commuting and greenhouse gas emissions. It's a huge challenge for us as we work on our customary planning documents and processes. It will require innovative thinking and solutions and new partnerships among government agencies, private sector companies, transit providers, new technology providers, and communities. I would like to welcome Professor Mozingo to uh, present for us today, and I uh, thank you all for being here, here in the room and online, and please, um, please uh, look forward to having a, a lively Q&A session after we hear from Professor Mozingo. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that um, very gracious introduction. I appreciate it very much. Um, I am very, very pleased to be here. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, I concur that we are in a situation in which everybody needs to be doing some good thinking together. And what I'm going to try to do today is um, give you a kind of, uh, actually, a, probably something, something, what of a much broader view of um, how suburbs got. 
uh, have, are in the current situation they're in in order for us to sort of untangle that for the future. I also have to say that I'm very pleased. I see one of my former students in the audience, and um, Lara, it's great to see you, and that's um, particularly um, thrilling for me. Um, so this um, title, The Challenge of the Suburban Office Landscape. So... This is the business as usual environment of the, of the suburban office. Um, this happens to be Silicon Valley, but we see these at the periphery of most American cities and now indeed actually across the world as well. Um, built on the American model. And what I'm going to talk about today is, one, how did we get here? Um, this was not a, hap a happenstance building of the city. It was actually a very deliberate building of the city through a series of forces. What are the, now the forces of change to this landscape? And are there new models for the suburban office? And I'm going to use the Silicon Valley to talk about that. One, because I teach at Berkeley and I live in San Francisco. This is in my backyard. And what has happened there over the last three or four years um, actually um, it has uh, proved to be, it's, it's actually quite provocative in a lot of different ways. And um, every time I think I've figured it out, um, there's a new piece to it that gets added, and I find myself revising my view. And part of that is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so how did we get there? But before I do that, I want to introduce a little bit about myself. Um, I'm actually a kind of weird hybrid person that gets to exist in academia, but not very many other places. So thank you very much to the people of California that have made the spectacular system of the University of California. Um, because I am both a historian, and I wrote a book called Pastoral Capitalism, which is about the history of suburban offices. Um, at the same time, I founded uh, and the first director of a center research center at UC Berkeley called the Center for Resource Efficient Communities. And we really look at the issues of urban design, urban planning, and urban policy, really about the shape of the city as it affects water and resource consumption. So I wear these two very different hats. And actually, my talk today is very much informed by both of these. Um, and many people think of historians as slightly, you know, slightly fuzzy-headed people who like archives too much. Um, um, but I think of history as a very active part about thinking about the future, about environmental planning, um, about uh, thinking about new kinds of solutions. So I just want to give you that context of myself and the talk that I'm going to give today. So first, I'm going to subject you to a little history, which you might have been subjected to, to with some um, with less pleasure than I hope you're going to have today in your past education. Um, but, so let's talk about a, few, a little bit of history. Um, one of the things that I found is in researching the um, history of the suburban offices, uh, the suburban offices, they were actually three distinct types, and they um, evolved out of a very distinct, distinct set of business structures um, that evolved, started evolving in the 1920s and then moved forward. And they were as I call them, three very specific types. They're used kind of interchangeably in terms of sort of popular culture and real estate and so forth. But um, the first were corporate campuses, which for, were for R&D staffs. Um, they were big corporate estates, which were the big um, uh, uh, suburban corporate headquarters, which were for executive staffs. And these two kinds of suburban offices uh, corporations built for themselves. And the last type are the office parks, which were speculative developments for, m built by developers for tenant corporations, office, uh, tenant um, corporations who had offices in different sort of regions of the country. Um, and uh, I'm going to, what's interesting about this is that, that these, um, the kinds of decisions that were being made, particularly in the post-war era by American corporation, is the reason that we are, that we have these very low density, highly dispersed, auto-dependent uh, suburban offices that now are a huge conundrum in terms of thinking about the future in terms of transportation of land use. So I thought it would be worth it to talk a little bit about these so that you you understand how 
tenacious turning this around might be. Um, this is really, I, this, this might be seem a little bit esoteric, but as I'll wrap back to what's happening in the Silicon Valley today, it has everything to do with the changes um, that might happen there. American corporations invented a hierarchical system of business management known as managerial capitalism, and it's something we're all very, very familiar with. There are top executives, there are uh, middle management uh, divisions, and then there are lower regional offices and lower management divisions. Um, beginning in the 19, late 1920s and 1930s, research and development became a really key part of corporations. Um, and they used to, research scientists and engineers who worked for corporations typically worked in factory sites. Um, but um, beginning in the late 1930s and then really picking up during the post-war era, um, corporations began building specialized sites for R&D R &D, um, R &D staffs. And they had a very particular and very consistent site plan. They had a large central open space that was then ringed by buildings that then was ringed by parking um, and truck access and material so that they could deliver experimental materials um, to the corporate campuses because these scientists were engaging in some very basic research. And one of the reasons they built these is because they were competing with universities for the best scientists. And so they began imitating the university landscape um, to encourage scientists to come into business rather than sustain academia. And the first of these was the AT&T Bell Telephone Laboratories, which actually opened in 1942, but it was actually planned in 1929 to 30. These scientists originally worked in factory sites or loft buildings, extremely crowded conditions in industrial context um, with lots of manufacturing around them. And then in 1942, they got to go out here in the suburbs of New York in an 800-acre site with these beautiful light-filled offices, these spectacular experimental facilities, a great cafeteria, which Google did not invent, at and did, um, and lots of lounging places where they could sort of think, you know, come together and think really interesting and innovative thoughts. Again, and this is the model for everything else. This is the Kevin Bacon of this story, okay? Everything goes back to this AT&T campus. Um, and um, and AT&T labs kind of literally changed the world. In 1948, they invented two things. They invented the mathematical model of information, the bit, and they invented the transistor. And you could argue that it changed human history. I think it actually did. But it sort of set them up, it, it, it conjoined this um, certain kind of facility with a certain level of extremely prof profitable innovation um, that um, came together here. And then very quickly, other corporations saw this success and um, imitated it. This is the General Motors Technical Center of 1956, a really classic corporate campus site plan, center, center open space, ring of buildings, ring of uh, truck access and parking all around the perimeter, a site one mile by two, a huge facility. When it opened, President Eisenhower spoke. It was on the front pages of, the, of every newspaper in the country. Um, it was covered on the evening news. The first of these in California was not in the Silicon Valley, but actually in, in Southern California, the Ramo Wooldridge uh, Laboratories of 1958, um, of Canoga Park, California, a very kind of upper middle class um, suburban uh, community. Ramo Wilders was doing a lot of defense work. They invented lots and lots of things for guided missiles and so forth. Um, and then a little bit later in the 1970s, you had the first of these close to the Silicon Valley. Both, uh, uh, all of them designed by East Coast corporations who were trying to establish a West Coast presence. The IBM Santa Teresa Laboratory was really well known. Um, and this goes on. This is the Boeing Longacres Park in Renton, Washington for um, the Boeing company. So these are still being built. Um, um, uh, it's certainly uh, uh, still being built, and it's still very much a model. And again, this is, these are facilities that corporations built for themselves. The second set of these uh, suburban offices um, were the corporate estates. I call them the corporate estates. And these are the um, suburban, very grand suburban um, facilities of the top executive of corporations. Typically, they have very, very large sites, at least 200 acres up to 2,000 
thousand acres um, with kind of grand displays of landscape. Usually they have great sweeping driveways. They're visible from surrounding highways. Um, they have one or two big blocks of parking kind of nestled into the landscape so that when you look out from the building, everything is green. This happens to be the Weyerhaeuser Corporation headquarters um, outside of Tacoma. And um, the word is that George Weyerhaeuser actually got the state highway to change the railing on the adjacent highways so that everybody could see into the site. Um, and um, the early ones, again, were on the East Coast. Uh, this is Connecticut General, 1957. Big, huge site, 400 acres, two big blocks of parking, a very spectacular modernist building. Um, that's the chairman of um, uh, Connecticut General showing the building model to uh, the governor of Connecticut. The Deer and Company Administrative Center in Moline, Illinois, another really big, uh, uh, important and very influential example of this. And what typically happened, like the corporate campus, there were you know, three or four or five corporations who presented these sites to the rest of the business community, community and then they were quickly imitated. Um, and um, including the Weyerhaeuser corporate headquarters, as I mentioned, um, outside of Tacoma, 1,200 acres of reforested landscape. Um, Union Carbide, I'm just going to show you, again, how they proliferated across the country. Um, this is the Codex headquarters in Canton, Massachusetts. And then we have our very first one in California, which is the Apple II campus on um, in Cupertino, California, which is now under construction. Um, 180 acres in this a very, very, very expensive land in the Silicon Valley, one big, you know, spectacular, singular building, um, big block of parking on the perimeter, and then a very large bucolic site. Come back to this um, in a minute. The last of these suburban office types that developed in the post-war era were the office parks. And these really served this lower tier management of large corporations who were establishing regional offices in all major and minor cities in the country. Um, they were built by local developers for these, um, uh, for these corporations. And they also housed startups of various sorts, you know, new businesses that were proliferating during the post-war era, and lots of service businesses, businesses that served other corporations like accountants and lawyers um, and, and so forth. Um, and the office park um, is called many, many different things. Research park, you know, it has this big, long list of them, but they're all sort of around this idea um, of these sort of slightly interchangeable buildings. And what's typical um, of these um, of these office parks that you can see here, um, I think, I hope, um, on this uh, uh, photograph is that you have individual sort of smallish buildings, each one surrounded by their own pool of parking. The buildings might be quite various, though they tend to be pretty sort of generic buildings. The earliest of these were actually in the cities of the southeast, um, Montgomery and Atlanta, um, and then in Boston, uh, Massachusetts as well, around Route 120 where there was, a, in the post where there were a lot of new technology startups coming out of MIT and Harvard, but particularly N MIT, and they built this, you know, big um, beltway around, um, around Massachusetts, and they located these office parks, and again, generally middle and upper middle class suburban communities. Um, and the Stanford Industrial Park uh, that opened in 1954 is actually one of these office parks. Many people think it's some kind of like startup place or incubator thing. It's not. This was a for-profit enterprise of Stanford University who had 6,000 acres, couldn't sell any of it, um, needed cash, and so they developed this um, office park model. They initially called it an industrial park and then figured out that that really wasn't what they wanted to, the, the the tenants they wanted to target, and they renamed it the Stanford Research Park. And typically, um, the uh, Stanford uh, uh, Industrial Later Research Park had branch offices of large national corporations that wanted to be in the Bay Area to take advantage of the kind of engineering students that were coming out of uh, Berkeley and um, Stanford and um, 
and sort of expand their businesses. And, of course, there were also some important homegrown businesses. That's the one of the early offices of Hewlett-Packard right there. Um, this is the way it looks today, sort of built out, but it's still, you know, it's still very much an office park. Again, individual buildings surrounded by their own pool of parking. As office park developed, they sort of tend to develop their main roadways, tend to develop sort of a parkway look of one kind or another. And then you have interspersed little bits of landscape to break up the, uh, the um, big um, asphalt parking lot because there was pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio in, ter in terms of the square footage of parking to the square footage of building. And as you can see here in the Stanford Research Park, very low density. Single to maximum three-story buildings was quite typical, um, sort of spread out over a large site pulled back from the street, and very much an auto-oriented landscape. All of these were really auto-oriented landscape. This is the Research Triangle Park was also one of these versions of an office park. But you see these all over the periphery of American cities, and I said now also of international cities as well. One of the things about office parks is they get built out over time, and that's perfectly fine. Their mortgages are usually about 30 years, so um, they work um, with uh, prospective tenants, maybe sometimes building a custom building. The prospective tenant can either rent part of the building building or a whole building or read several buildings in an office park. They're extremely flexible in terms of the offices that they house. And this flexibility is their real um, advantage in terms of uh, businesses. Um, and again, here's the, this is the site plan of the Cornell uh, uh, Corporate Center. They have this very nice lush parkway. Here's a uh, adjacent freeway, so you can look into the park. And here it is at build out. Again, each one of these buildings with its own um, sort of uh, periphery of um, parking lots broken up with little bits of um, uh, landscape as well. And office parks completely dominate the Bay Area high technology landscape. This is what we find all over the Silicon Valley. I had a very interesting um, experience um, a year and a half ago when I got this call from, an email rather, from um, a Chilean travel writer. She wrote, writes for a Chilean national newspaper. And she'd been sent to the Bay Area and um, to find out uh, if there was a sort of travel or tourism opportunity for people to come to the Silicon Valley. And she spent a certain amount of time trying to find it, and she emailed me and she says, could I interview you? And I said, sure. And she came to me, and her first question was, where is the Silicon Valley? Yeah. And she couldn't actually figure out, uh, she couldn't actually understand this landscape. First of all, she was probably expecting an actual valley as opposed to the edge of the San Francisco Peninsula. And then, you know, these are very unprepossessing kinds of places. They're sort of places that you whiz by on the freeway. Um, and, you know, that there are kind of ironical movies made about these places or television shows and so forth. So um, it was very, very confusing but you can completely understand it. And um, one of the things about this, um, this landscape is it actually very much suits um, what up until this time has been, uh, or up until this time has very much suited um, Silicon Valley entrepreneurship. Um, because in Silicon Valley, as we know, there's uh, innovation, and then there's kind of startups, and then you get some venture capital, and then you know maybe you explode, or maybe you do or do not go to an initial public offering, or maybe you just get outgunned by some other competitor. Remember Palm Pilots, um, um, and you know, and the whole thing goes bust. And so these uh, office parks were perfect for that. Um, so you know, you got your initial idea, you rented half a floor of one of these buildings in an office park. You got a little VC, then you went venture capital, and then you went to a whole floor, and then you got a lot more venture capital, so maybe you went to a whole building, and then you went out initial public offering, and then, or maybe probably later than that, but it, you go to several buildings in the office park, and then, oops, it really didn't all work, and so then you retract and you go on to something else. This is very, very typical of the Silicon Valley. So that's one of the reasons that these office parks landscapes have worked. The, you know, if you have a up until this time, what was an upscale Silicon Valley moment is what, hap what Apple did, which is they had what they called the Infinite Loop Campus, which is a tiny compact corporate campus um, on one larger site within an office park, which they probably own actually outright. They bought the lot from the um, 
um, from the office park developer, and then they're just in a whole bunch of other miscellany of office building, and that's very, very, very typical of the Silicon Valley up until this time. The Googleplex, which everybody knows from the internet, uh, which um, was actually formerly Silicon Graphics Inc.'s headquarters, they went away. They're one of those companies went up, went down, disappeared. Um, but Google moved into um, they they had enough money at one point to build a very fancy building, um, but they're actually in all all of the office parks that are surrounding the Google. They're in all of these uh, office parks and all of these and uh, inching up over here and the Intuit's over here um, um, and they sort of share some things. So that's very, very typical of the Silicon Valley. Um, and not only Silicon Valley, but many other places. These office parks are enormously flexible. They're also very, very profitable for developers in a place where there's a lot of thriving, where there's a thriving economy. At this point, I'd like to go back and ask the question um, and share with you what I found out about why these places happen. This is one of the things I do as a historian, is that I just don't take it for granted that something happened. I try to understand why. And this is, again, the way that I think about history in this critical way to inform the future. Um, one of the things that I found, and I, I read a huge amount of both corporate literature, business literature, um, and just popular literature and planning literature in the, in the post-war uh, in the post-war period from 1945 until 1965, and the way that they portrayed the problem of the city was that it was crowded, congested, and frankly, it was diverse. And in particular, corporations were finding the increasing diversity of the post-war city very, very problematic. Um, and um, and you know they were looking for elsewhere. Um, another thing is that. You know, American corporations were expanding dramatically, and I mention again this in terms of the uh, 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 engineers and scientists who work for corporations, but there were actually a lot of executives and chief executive officers that actually worked in factory sites, in big center city factory sites. And there was this really important I interest in distinguishing executive staffs from um, from increasingly unionized labor um, of factory sites. So there was a class issue here as well. Um, there was also this, what I found to be actually a slightly odd um, conviction um, that's summarized here in this brochure from GM when they opened their research center, a view of Patty Owen Poole contributes to precision engineering. They absolutely believe that a view of the landscape would make you more productive. And there are long-term origins about this that you have to read my book about. But it was a really surprising thing for me. You know, there were these corporate executives that people that were saying, everybody can think better and work better in the country. Okay, good. Um, so, and so they were moving their offices to the country. Or it, it, that was one of the reasons. And then, of course, we were building highways. We were opening up. Um, huge new tracts of land to be included in the metropolitan economic region, and that was very, very important. This was also a time of increasing of, of increasing family formation, and you know, uh, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> the Cleavers, um, Leave It to Beaver, and the Cleavers are a. Um, kind of a stereotype, but it's a stereotype that has some resonance, particularly among corporate workers, corporate office workers. Um, so you have this brochure, for instance, in Canoga Park, which uh, this is from the Chambers of Commerce, ideal suburban living in Canoga Park. And there were three components. There were single-family ranch houses, there were um, recreation and park facilities, and there was an R&D campus. And this was ideal suburban living. Um, all of these three things together, to live, to recreate, and to work in the suburbs was ideal. Um, it certainly wasn't accessible to everyone. There was also really specific workforce issue that corporations were aiming for. Um, both in technology companies and in other companies, women, um, white, women, educated women, were moving to the suburbs because they were forming families, um, and the corporate staffs were um, following them because secretarial, clerical workers, and uh, low-level technology workers were um, largely white women in the 1950s. This was a fantastic ad I found of Western Electric called The Girl in the Middle. Um, and she's working at a technology lab doing prototyping, um, and that's who was 
was doing that kind of fine grain work. Um, so these women were increasingly in the suburbs, and the corporations were following them. Um, and um, and also, again, they were of the kind of racial profile that they were interested in. Um, <clears throat> they were also afraid that uh, secretaries in downtown situations might get unionized. So they were really um, uh, um, they were very wary of that. Um, so this is the General Electric's Electronics Park in Syracuse, New York. It opened in 1948. And they, um, in 1952, Business Week wrote an article about it, and they used this fantastic phrase, work goes on in a campus-like atmosphere that the brainy youngsters seem to go for. And that kind of sums it all up. Um, these corporations, one of those brainy youngsters, um, and that's where they found that they were. So what, uh, what this created... Um, I call the separatist geography of business. Whether we're talking about the corporate campus or the corporate estate or the office park, I use these terms very precisely. In popular literature now, they're all referred to as campuses, which is fine. Um, you know, I'm an academic and I have to be sort of nitpicky about these things, but they, they have some commonalities that are really important. Out of this out of these, uh, these uh, building, suburban building types and out of these forces came three really important uh, pieces to it. They're low density and they're heavily landscaped to both meld with um, middle class communities and to reflect this ideal suburban living of the 1940s and 50s. The second thing was, and I found this a lot in the literature, they were it absolutely intended to capture they, I found that term over and over, to capture employees for the entire day. They very deliberately had limited ways in and out. They deliberately lacked pedestrian connections and other transportation connections to the larger landscape. There was deliberately no public realm. And thirdly, they were entirely auto-dependent. Dependent. Obviously, we're building freeways. The, um, the auto companies had tremendous sway in this. Uh, public transportation systems were being dismantled in center cities. And here, this was going to solve everybody's problem. Everybody was just going to commute to work, and you're going to commute between your suburban workplace and your suburban home. So this was this was all was created out of a very deliberate set of decisions. Um, uh, uh, so it's not a happenstance set of decisions. It may seem um, in so many ways incoherent as we travel through them today, but they were immensely coherent to the people that were inventing these in the 1950s and 60s. So I talked about how office parks very well suit the Silicon Valley entrepreneurial cycle. And from this point onward, I'm going to focus in on the on the Silicon Valley, um, because uh, we see here uh, in a concentrated way a set of forces for change. Um, and again, I, uh, I just want to um, be clear about where, where the Silicon Valley is. Here's the San Francisco Bay. Here is the San Francisco Peninsula. Uh, yeah, San Francisco is up here, and the original sort of the original Silicon Valley is from San, was San, sort of San Mateo to San Jose on the eastern side of the San Francisco Peninsula along the San Francisco Bay. Many people now argue that it's spread all over the Bay Area along all of its major freeways, and I, I think that there there is certainly some validity to that. But still, it remains that the real concentration is between San Mateo and San Jose, and the many cities between them, San Carlos, Redwood City, Menlo Park, Palo Alto, Mountain View, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, Cupertino, uh, Campbell, um, Los Gatos, Saratoga, all these places that um, we certainly have heard of. Um, and along its uh, major freeways, particularly 101, you find this office park landscape. So um, again, I'm, from this point forward, I'm going to talk more about the Silicon Valley because I've been watching it very closely over the last three or four years um, to understand and, and trying to understand what are the forces of change um, and the responses to them. First of all, I mean, I think every, I, I mean I know I'm completely and totally preaching to the choir, but in case any of you haven't heard this yet, the parking lot and freeway transportation model really doesn't address either current transportation issues much less a post-peak oil and water future. So we all know that, and that's, that's in everybody's mind, and the whole issue around sustainable land use and sustainable transportation is certainly key. This model doesn't work anymore. And if I don't have to convince you, go on 101 be, uh, in Mountain View at about 5.15 in the afternoon. Pretty good. 
Um, certainly from suburban residents, there is a greater demand for an, an enriched community serving public realm. There's a lot of discussion about what is the public realm in suburbs, how do we make it, how do we encourage it, and so forth. Um, and that is a, a, a something that is, um, it's a constant sort of sort of a low drumbeat and sometimes a much higher and more vociferous drumbeat um, in suburban communities, and that's really quite key. This is actually the other really interesting thing to me. Millennials are going to comprise 75% of the workforce by 2025. 77% of millennials plan to live in the urban core. And 60% um, of millennials prefer to work um, in in-person collaboration. The other thing that's happening is that younger generations are consistently showing less interest in driving and cars than previous generation. This is the first time there is a significant downturn in car ownership or car driving as a means to kind of as a means to sort of get around on the metropolitan region. Real estate developers know this, and they're trying to pay attention to this, and they're trying to sort of think about what that means. Um, and this is the source is the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. Um, and then these other statistics are from the Kilroy Realty Corporation, which has been doing a lot of sort of analyses of what millennials are interested in in terms of workplaces. In the Silicon Valley, there's also this um, the other incredible force of change, and I know that this is not everywhere. There is this red hat uh, job market. Um, you know, the, the jobs are just growing in extraordinary, to an extraordinary extent, both in San Francisco, the East Bay, but also in Santa Clara County. Um, and, um, and, and the San Francisco area, that, that number also includes San Mateo and Marin, Marin County. So San Mateo, which has a lot of the Silicon Valley companies in it. So there is this red hot uh, job market. Um, the other thing is that real estate prices in the Bay Area, you don't need to t say this, and we don't need to say this, are really astronomical. Everybody knows that about residential uh, real estate, but what a lot of people don't understand is now that the most expensive office buildings, um, uh, uh, rents, uh, office building rents in the entire country are along Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto. This is the corridor where all the venture capitalists are. Um, this is more than a picture postcard skyscraper in New York City. Um, it, is the, it is the most expensive office buildings in the country, which a lot of people don't understand. Okay, and then this is the key thing. The brainy youngsters are trending urban and urbane. Uh, there's no, absolutely no question about this. They are taking a 360-degree 350, a turn from their grandfather's workplace and are really interested in a very different work and life experience um, than their grandparents. Um, this is a San Francisco parklet. I live in San Francisco, and my two of my students it, you know, got these going all, all over San Francisco and now all over the country and all over the world. Um, but I still have this, these, these, you know, as a middle-aged Person, I still go to think like, really, this is pleasant. I don't know, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, but they love it. Okay, so but that gives you an idea that their values are really quite different. And then, if I wasn't convinced of this, last spring, Warehouser announced that it is moving from its grand palace. At palace that it spent tens of millions of dollars building and maintaining over the last forty years into downtown Seattle on a public park, on a public square, in a brand new building. That's all, you know, eco, eco this and that. I mean, this is a, an astounding abandonment of post-war values uh, by a major American corporation. Okay, now obviously the tech companies have tried to sort of deal with this by doing the infamous private bus lines, the, the Google bus, though there's a, there are, I think there are now 15 companies that are running buses from San Francisco into the Silicon Valley. It's highly controversial in many different kinds of ways. Obviously it's better than everybody being in their cars, but at this point it takes about two hours to get from San Francisco to the Google offices in, in Mountain View. Each way, okay? So that is half their working day. And um, I've heard this sort of, and I, have, I have lots of spies down there now. And they call me up and say, this is what they're saying. Um, and one of them said that the HR 
a person from Google um, and um, one of the, not the two partners, but somebody just below them had a meeting with SPUR, the uh, um, San Francisco Planning and Urban Research Group, um, and they said, you know, we can't do this anymore. We can't have our, our people having half their workday on a bus um, because they're considered at work the moment they get on the bus. But if it's four hours, that means half their workday is on the bus. And I don't care if it's a really comfortable bus, you're still working on a bus. Um, and they know that and everybody knows that. So this is not a tenable for a really long term besides all the other issues it's creating. Okay, so what are the, what, are, what, am, I, what am I seeing right now in terms of the opportunities in the Silicon Valley? One of the things that's now um, certainly, um, uh, certainly accelerating in a new kind of way is the recycling of suburban sites. This is Santa Clara. Of course, this is the, uh, the, 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 um, this is the Levi Stadium where the 49ers now play. But they are redeveloping this very large site that's actually a golf course and um, some other sort of uh, nominal buildings, um, and an old kind of industrial office park um, site. That's going to become a new, um, a new headquarters for um, Yahoo. There's a, new, there's a light rail line along here. Um, that Capitol Corridor is over here. And these sites are now under sort of a, a, um, a, a, the Yahoo site has actually been approved, and then the City Place site, as they're calling it, is, going, is under sort of planning review right now. And they're trying to move to a different model. And um, uh, the Yahoo site is a little bit indicative of this. First of all, it's higher density. Um, all the parking is underground. It's still very parking dependent, but it's underground. Um, but the other thing that's very, very different about it is that it sort of brings the, the buildings to the street. And it has actually, the intent is that the interior of the site is going to be public. Um, with public serving facilities, which is very different from this whole long-term post-war model. Um, and it can, will be pen, penetrable by um, pedestrians. Um, and there's, a sort of, there's also a transportation, uh, some innovative transportation work that's going on with this as well. Um, and obviously there have been already developers who are looking for places of higher density of urbanity and looking for these opportunity sites. This is Santana Row in San Jose, which is slightly weird. It's a place you drive to to have a center city experience, which is very, very strange in some ways. And it's, you know, it's wickedly, wickedly controlled. Like the whole place, um, you know, it, there's something about it that's worse than Disneyland. Despite, I like the shops, don't get me wrong. Um, but um, uh, it's, it, is, it is highly, highly controlled, but it is much higher density. It is mixed use. Um, it is, um, uh, you know, it is trying to introduce um, a kind of public realm into a place that hasn't had one. And they're building a new building. Um, which is actually I found out is actually going to be um, leased by Apple, um, and this uh, it's called 500 Santana Row. And they again here they're having a shared public space in front of and through the building. Again, there there are these this is attempts at sort of thinking about the public realm. Um, Another development is one done by Kilroy Real Estate, the Crossing 900. This is in downtown Redwood City. It's right on the Caltrain line. Um, it is eight minutes from Stanford, 22 minutes from downtown San Francisco. Um, it's not a huge building. It's only around 300, you know, 339,000 uh, square feet. But it is going to be the box headquarters. So the box, the people who, you know, exchange, um, uh, 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 you know. You can send data through them <laughs> anyway. Um, so it's going to be the box headquartered. And isn't it in a downtown situation? It's an old downtown, and it's, it has that kind of snaggletooth quality of you know some sites being open. But this is going to be seen as a catalyst. And again, much higher density. Um, in this case, seven stories. Um, again, a lot of parking, all of it underground, however. Uh, but again, the possibility of greater transportation connectivity. And then you have sort of these medium-range, old-style office parking developers um, in uh, the Silicon Valley. This is Land Bank. Um, they built these office buildings in the late 60s and 70s. This is one of their sites, and they are rebuilding it in a much higher density way, uh, structured parking, some underground, and then again, sort of bringing the buildings um, to the kind of public edge. There's still very much, there's a kind of a 
a, a, a perimeter of, of, of landscape. There's, there are filters here without a doubt, but um, there are still pieces of it you can kind of move through, and it's connected to the pedestrian realm in new kinds of ways, and they're trying to work um, with the city of Sunnyvale in terms of uh, bicycle transportation and so forth. Um, and then um, Facebook. Um, now, um, so, uh, yeah, you have to know, um, one of the things I need to be uh, kind of come clean here is that when I first saw some of these projects, I was very sort of skeptical about them. I sort of thought, okay, this is just like the 1950s over with sort of a different vocabulary. Um, but um, let me show you a little bit about what Facebook is doing. You know, whatever we think about the hoodies and Mark Zuckerberg, we have to, it's very, very, it is actually very interesting what they're trying to do. They bought a very classic um, kind of compact corporate campus um, in um, Menlo Park from Sun Microsystems, which is one of those companies that went up and then went away. Um, and it was built in 1995, and they bought it in 2011. Again, that gives you an idea of this rapid cycling that happens in the Silicon Valley. And this was a pretty classic. This They bought, uh, Sun Microsystem had, a, there was a master developer, then they bought this site, and they had these custom buildings built, and they had this little central open space. Again, these kind of squeeze um, uh, corporate campuses, not like the big lavish ones of the East Coast. And they had this kind of green interior space, uh, very, very typical um, kind of uh, corporate campus model. The new Facebook campus turn that into a street. Um, and at first I kind of thought this was, okay, this is just, you know, it's just hips and, hipsters and happening and whatever. They're just trying to indicate that they're not the old Silicon Valley. They're the new Silicon Valley. Um, and they have, uh, you know, like fast, quote, unquote, fast food prices. And they have ice cream stores. Everything's free. Um, and they, have, they put in roll-up garage doors, you know, recalling the innovation of garages and you know, it's kind of goofy. Anyway, um, and then they have, like, they have a, a bicycle store where you can get bicycles and so forth. Then they started being very, very aggressive about trying to encourage people to use their bicycle. Um, and, you know, they redid their center plaza, which used to be a big green space, um, and they put the word hack so you can see it from an airplane. Or if you, if you Google Facebook headquarters Menlo Park, it'll just go right on that hack, you know, so it's like it's all part of a kind of new vision of them. Now, they also hired Frank Geary to uh, design a new building because they, this is their, the old Sun Microsystem sites. Um, this is one of the, the Bayshore Expressway, not 101, it's along the Bayshore. Um, and they bought a site here and they had Frank Geary design the building. They put a huge green roof on it that's supposed to be for the, um, for the um, employees. There's one single huge floor space of 100,000 square feet, um, plus three others. Um, all the parking is underground. Um, and then they proceeded to buy a set of other sites. Um, this site right here, uh, next to the Geary Building site, which is even bigger. And then they just recently brought the Prologus site, um, which is, who is a, a office park developer, and they brought it from them. They bought it for $400 million, so almost half a billion dollars. And they're going to tear it down, probably. This is the plan for that they're working with um, with the city of Menlo Park about trying to rethink the model that this office park model. I mean, they're working within uh, an existing site with existing transportation and existing buildings. Um, they're going to re be rebuilding bu buildings, but you can notice a couple of important things. One, they're actually proposing that their, the parking lots in their east, what they call the east campus, the original Sun Microsystem building, be actually redeveloped for housing. Um, the TE connectivity site is going to be an expansion of their offices, and that's going to include very, very specific public serving facilities or a public realm. They're going to put a public market there. Um, Menlo Park doesn't really have a farmer's market. Um, the Prologus site is going to be developed as mixed use, relatively high density, and then there's this um, abandoned Dumbarton Rail Corridor that they're very seriously consider, considering for a new transportation corridor. Um, so whatever we can say about Hoodies and Mark Zuckerberg and so forth, they are very conscious that you know the, the bus lines, the private bus lines are not really serving them particularly well. Um, and the city of Menlo Park is asking questions of them about uh, whether or not there can be a public realm associated with this. 
So um, that uh, is a, in, a very interesting thing. The, the combination of the three, what are going to be the three campuses, the East Campus, what they call the West Campus, and then this new TAE conductivity site, they are dramatically in increasing square footage, but their pledge is to reduce car trips by 50% through a combination of systems um, and new kinds of uh, connectivity. So ex again, exactly the opposite set of values that um, that the kind of post-war era brought, uh, uh, brought to this discussion. Um, let's, and at this point, I want to return to the Apple II campus because when I first listed, looked at this, I, I actually, I mean, I literally groaned. I said, oh, my God, does anybody think it's 1954 anymore? What are we going to do? Here's this really influential project. And, you know, and this is all true. It is all completely true that it is, in so many ways, a nostalgic project, a kind of, uh, in terms of its sort of transportation vision, and actually its vision on the landscape, a kind of retrograde project, this sort of single-use, large-scale building, um, it, you know, s serving a very elite a core of corporate employees. What's interesting, as I see the outfall of this project, is that it has completely changed the ambition for building in the Silicon Valley, which was mostly these kind of very ordinary, plain office buildings in the parking lots. Um, kind of that, that wasn't important. And whatever you can say about this, and there's lots and lots to critique here, is that it sort of opened up a, um, a new kind, a set of thinking, particularly amongst the kind of corporations in the valley, that they could be more ambitious about their building. The Facebook stuff, Facebook came after this, um, and what I'm going to show you also came after this. It, but you know, it sort of changed the ambition, and then Facebook is taking it in that ambition in a new direction in terms of really significantly trying to influence transportation um, and planning um, and, and land use planning as well. So this is what has happened out of this. Um, Steve Jobs, the Irvine company right there. This was a. a um, a housing complex owned by the Irvine Company, and Steve Jobs um, offered them the sun and the moon to buy that lot because he wanted the whole lot to make a kind of clean, uh, you know, edge around his campus. Um, and the Irvine Company, which still sort of has a lot of family control, they absolutely refused, um, and they hung on to it. And so he proceeded. Now this is what um, uh, uh, he proceeded. So, um, but let's for, also let's go back and look at the Apple campus. First of all, they are increasing building from um, you know about two and a half million square feet to uh, uh, over three and a half million square feet. So they're increasing the density by a million square feet. So this is a process, somewhat of a process of densification, which might not have been obvious. This was an old um, Hewlett Packard office park site. They were in various buildings and a bunch of other office parks. Um, they're also decreasing the impervious surface from, um, um, from 130 acres to 74 acres, and that's by sort of concentrating the parking and so forth. That's not huge gains, and again, it's, there's a lot to critique here, but it, is, it also is indicative of this process of densification. And this is what is more interesting. So first, the Irvine Company proposed actually tearing down the um, uh, existing housing, and they are going to rebuild it from um, increasing from 392 units to 942 units. So they're doubling the residential density of that um, of that development. And then across the freeway um, is was the old Valco Shopping Center, which is a really typical 19. I think it opened in 1961, um, 61 to 63. You know, big building big, huge sea of parking around it. And um, developers had collected a whole set of lots uh, that was sort of had been parceled up in different kinds of ways, and they're planning a quite new kind of development. This is, um, this is Cupertino. Uh, Cupertino is a very pretty cl classic um, single-family ranch house um, sub -suburban, um, uh, suburban community. Um, and this is the yeah. new project. Um, and in order to sort of meet enormous resistance to increasing density um, in the community, they've actually proposed this massive green roof that, that um, uh, 
kind of curls up from the adjacent uh, suburban community. Um, and you can kind of see it here. This huge green roof, it's over 30 acres. This is what it's supposed to look like from the top. The impression is that it's going to reproduce the quality of the hills around it. And it's going to have a vineyard on it. <laughs> um, and, you know, big kind of grassy open spaces. But what's interesting is what's going on here, because what th that is are the tops of a very high-density mixed-use development. So this is a street underneath this green roof. This has just been promoted about six weeks ago. It came, um, they, they first uh, brought it out at a kind of Kiwanis Club meeting, and then now they, it's in for planning review. Um, it's still auto-dependent. Um, all the parking is underground, uh, but they're working, with the, they're, they're working with the city to develop some kind of transit hub around this. Um, and the, um, the density is up to eight stories, which, again, I mean, I, I understand we know need to go higher density than that, but this is dramatically different than most parts of, um, most parts of the sur suburban periphery of any city, um, and certainly the Silicon Valley. And it's intended to be this place of kind of enormous um, sort of a hub of activity. It has a completely mixed-use um, offices, housing, um, um, uh, 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 retail facilities, uh, recreation of various sorts, and then all of it capped by this um, green roof. So, um, as I look at this, then my question is, where does all this leave us? Now, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure everybody in this room, and um, uh, certainly for myself, we're all concerned about making a sustainable future, a met sustainable metropolitan future. And it occurs, there are several things that occur to me as I look at this uh, development. Uh, first of all, there is a very distinctive and unique opportunity that's happening in the Silicon Valley. You have these stupendously moneyed corporations and uh, the Apple office building is going to cost $5 billion. It's probably going to be the most expensive building ever built in the whole planet, ever. Um, and uh, certainly office building. OK, St. Peter's in Rome probably costs more over time. But um, um, it's, there are these stupendously moneyed corporations with, um, who are also, at the same time, to a, in a certain kind of sense, sort of backed into a corner because they're interested in attracting um, a certain kind of workforce um, who is not interested in living in the suburbs um, and who wants a very, very different kind of lifestyle. Uh, so this makes for, from the private sector, a huge, a, a possible, really important impetus to begin to really rethink, um, to really rethink the way that we're sort of managing land use um, across the metropolitan region. Um, so I think that that's one thing. The other really interesting thing to me is whether you're talking about corporations or you're talking about the cities or, or, and so forth, that in spite of the fact that these, these corporations and these places are places where the virtual and the digital and the non-place realm is supposed to dominate, what they are making are lots and lots of places where people come together as actual human beings. Um, so that is also, to me, in terms of a value, a very important thing to understand and to, again, um, engage in some new ways. Um, so th and so that then begins to ask the question, is in this place of sort of, again, stupendously money corporations who are both, uh, who are finding themselves in terms of their workforce issues sort of backed into a corner, um, who really recognize the importance of place, can that really and truly intersect with a new kind of redefinition of the suburban pu public realm? And, um, and including transit um, and all the other things that go with it. Um, and, um, and and the, the thing that is most vivid to me is that um, how are issues of equity going to be addressed? And that's the big issue around the Google buses, right, and all the other the Google buses standing in for all these other private bus lines. These solve the problem of individual corporations. It solves none of the problems for everybody else. And um, so 
Um, is there an opportunity here to solve these problems by these very powerful players, uh, but to engage them in a more public-minded discussion? I am not saying that easy, it's easy. I'm saying what I'm saying is this is the moment to begin having that discussion. Um, and one of the huge, huge problems is how we build cities. We build cities site by site jurisdiction by jurisdiction, usually municipal, and yet our problems are metropolitan. They're regional. And to me, this is the really huge gap we have to bridge. So, you know, we can, they can be this hills at Valco, and there can be Santana Row and so forth, and those are site, you know, this is the way we build cities. It's incremental. Um, yet these increments are going to have to add up to something new on the metropolitan or regional scale. And as far as I can tell right now, there is no institutional mechanism to bring those two things together. But I do think that if you have a kind of more active public sector and a private sector, as again, who I actually see is backed into a corner, um, coming together, you might get things to happen. This is what happened in the rebuilding of of American cities in the late 19th and early 20th century. All over the country now, we open our taps and we drink our water, and it's clean and it doesn't make us sick. Um, and the reason that that happened is that at that time, there were both private interests and public interests who were reformers and capitalists who were coming together and said, okay, we have to reform sewer systems and, um, and, and water supply systems and trash collection and everything else, and we don't even think about that today. And I think that this is what this is the kind of context that can happen in the suburbs right now. Or I mean, the Silicon Valley is a good place to do this ex experimentation. Let's put it that way. Um, um, so how can we leverage these? You know, again, stupendously large investment by corporations for a kind of greater uh, public um, uh, a public good. Um, I think that there's a third player in this, and that is the public. So we have the private, the pub, private sector and the public sector, but we also have the public. Um, and I, I'm thinking about this, the, what I'm next going to tell you, across a whole range of ideas. Um, we have to recouch some of this work as not only problem solving, but also for the public place making. We know that the, the private sector cares about place making. We know that the public sector traditionally cares about place making. But one of the things we have to capitalize on is that the, the public, um, the, the, the general public, the, the, you know, the residents of cities and regions also care about place making. And if we catch everything in terms of problem solving, I don't think we're going to get very far. We have to couch it in terms of placemaking. How is this going to benefit you? It may change your life, but is it good, how is it going to benefit you? I think that's really um, very, um, very important. Um, so I'm looking for a forum. And, you know, Caltrans is a very powerful organization. I just want to point that out. Um, I'm looking for a forum where people, can sit, uh, people are going to sit down from all of these sectors and begin discussing this in that, you know, awkward way that we have to do democracy in America, which is long and drawn out and frustrating, um, which corporations don't like. But... This is the way we get it done. But right now, there is not a forum to do this. There is not an institutional setting for this to happen. And I think that that's really quite important. Um, I'd just like to end with a quote that I recently, um, or it was about six months ago, found from the architect Renzo Piano, um, which I think is really um, important. It was, it was a real kind of um, enlightening, you know, you, you read something and go, oh, yes, that's it. Um, and he talked about how for the last sort of four or five decades, we've spent a lot of time trying to revitalize downtowns. And that's a really terribly, terribly important thing. Um, and, and, and many places, I see many cities that I would never have thought that they could have revived their downtowns, have re revived their downtowns. Durham, North Carolina, a place that um, suffered incredible sort of, um, uh, you know, the businesses and the people just sort of decanted out of downtown Durham about 30 years ago, and that's being revitalized. So there's a lot of, and, and not just in, you know, and, you know, Sacramento is another good, really, really good 
um, example of that. But Renzo Piano said if we've been doing that for the last four or five decades, the real challenge of the future is to reinvent the urban periphery. And then that's where we need to sort of kind of focus our efforts. It's going to be, you know, it, like the downtown, it's going to be hard and it's going to take some odd turns um, and, and so forth. But that is reinventing the urban periphery is really, really key. Okay. So thank you very much for listening to my spiel, my historian, planner, um, landscape architect piece here. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. that uh, you were giving Caltrans responsibility for a lot of this stuff, but it seems like it's really the, uh, the, the regional planning agencies that are taking yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm talking. I, I mean, I'm talking to Caltrans, and I'm just sort of pointing out that Cal, Caltrans has a role in this, certainly. Um, but obviously, so whether uh, now. The, the uh, regional planning agencies, as they are constituted right now, are relatively weak institutions, right? And, and um, you know, if, the, um, if a set of sort of public meetings and public planning that went around 375 um, is any indication, there's tremendous resistance to regional planning, right? And regional, you know, really... Um, so do those institutions get transformed, or how do we work around this? I mean, I, I don't... I don't have it. I don't have an exact um, way forward here. What I'm suggesting is that in the Bay Area right now, there's a particular opportunity uh, for a way forward, and that that then can become a model for way forwards in other places as well, other places in California and maybe across the country, because there are these intersection of some very powerful forces. This whole landscape was not invented in California. It was invented on the East Coast where there were particular kinds of circumstances and particular kinds of players that came together. And I think that, uh, to me, the, uh, uh, the real kind of key thing here is to understand that there's a particular set of circumstances and a particular set of players that are now sort of operating in the Bay Area that can lead to some new inventions. A question here. Okay. This is from Nick Smith, who's a transportation planner. What do you think of Donald Shoup's idea of lining the periphery of these huge Silicon Valley office parks and their parking lots with mixed-use developments? Um, I think that that's very, very opportune. Um, and again, that's a little bit what's happening around the Facebook site. They're proposing redeveloping their parking lot. Um, so this is, um, this is a quite viable idea going forward. Um, no question about it. Again, it's this move towards densification. Now, again, how do we make those add up into something that um, is integrated with new transit systems, new kind of um, uh, new kinds of mobility, um, new um, um, you know, in uh, dealing with issues of equity, particularly in housing and so forth. I think is the real challenge. Um, that's a good lead-in because I was just going to ask about equity in this site here. I, is City of Menlo, uh, Menlo uh, going to require affordable housing? And if so, then where are those people working in relation to where their where their housing is now? Have we created just a separate transportation issue um, by requiring uh, affordable housing? So the, the hills, which is actually. Cupertino is um, theoretically going to uh, accommodate an affordable housing component, uh, but this is, I mean, this is, I mean, it, it, um, <laughs> the, um, uh, you know, th there is a, the, the sort of stratospheric rise in real estate prices um, now, I mean, it is accelerating to such an extent um, that, I mean, um, <laughs> They, you know, it, it's, this is going to be very, very, very difficult to solve. Um, there's no question about it. Um, and, um, you know, the issue of equity, 
um, you know, one of the things I, I keep on asking, and I haven't been actually been able to find out, I keep on asking, you know, if the people who clean the Google offices, whether they get to take the Google buses, whether there's a Google bu bus route to where they live in Tracy or not. Um, and um, as far as I can tell, there isn't, but maybe there is. But um, um, so, you know, this is a, a, an enormous, enormous issue, and I don't want to underplay this in any kind of way. But, you know... <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to say this cautiously, but, um, uh, you know, we have for, uh, you know, a good three to four decades now um, allowed the private sector kind of free reign on our sort of urban landscape. And um, to me, it's really time. Um, and at some point, it's also going to be in their self-interest, which is the way things get done in cities, um, to take back some of that free reign and bring it back into a public serving realm. Now, I know that's a very typical kind of Berkeley professor kind of thing to say. I get that. But there is a reality to that. And we have to make decisions um, about the obligations um, of these um, very, very wealthy entities um, about their obligations to the places that where they have made that money. There's no question about it to me. And, um, you know, Apple has more cash reserves than the uh, United States of America. I'm not kidding. 180, million, million and, uh, 180 billion and counting. So... Looking at, your, Where? looking at the screen in the upper left-hand corner, mm -hmm. and apparently that's quite a new, new plan, uh, it doesn't look like a complete street. The bicycle is being walked in the walk crosswalk. Across. The traffic lanes look like they're about 17 feet wide. Um, Valera? Get on there. <laughs> Yeah, they, they will definitely, I mean, I, I'm not endorsing this plan. I'm showing you this plan as it's sort of being, it being. I think there's there's going to be a huge, I mean, we'll see if it happens, first of all, but, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of work to do here. Yes? Um, I noticed that um, in many of the new office parks, the, different maps you showed, you know, it shows mm -hmm. the big mm -hmm. cloverleaf interchange yeah. there, and we know how 101 is at capacity there, and Caltrain, etc. And you mentioned that though the parking is underground, so it looks prettier, it's still there. Correct. So there's, are, there's still thinking that most people are going to be driving into work. Right. Except for... Um, Facebook, which is trying to reverse the proportion. So they're getting to 50%, and they would like to see it significantly lowered. And, and they're actually, I mean, again, you know, um, how skeptical you can be about private interests and so forth, but, um, it, you know, the way that they're at this point seem to be working with Menlo Park in terms of also developing this new transit corridor along the Dumbarton Rail Line, I think is very, very heartening. So, How are local planning officials reacting to a lot of these proposed developments? Um, that's a very good question. And one of the problems is, one of the issues is, is that you have, I mean, I actually, I look at either the, the, the hills up Valco or even the, to a certain extent, uh, to, to a certain extent, even the Facebook site, and I haven't even talked about the Google thing because that's now sort of has sort of blown up. But um, and you know, I think that one of the issues is how does a planner even approach um, understanding this kind of site because it is so far out of the current zoning, uh, you know, planning specific plan uh, mode. Um, so how do you begin to evaluate it? Um, and I think that that's really, again, this issue of kind of um, uh, 
capacity building in terms of local planning agencies, how can, you know, municipal planning agencies begin, you know, how do they, uh, how do what their decisions, what decisions they make try to add up to something bigger, I think is the challenge. Again, I go back to this idea that there is a institutional rethinking that should be also be pr proposed here. Um, because these are a scale of project and a kind of complexity of project that's very difficult to understand. Now, in a place like Cupertino, they're extremely pro-development. They're certainly very much sort of, um, you know, the city council in particular is, you know, very pro-Apple. I mean, as on some level they should be. They provide a huge amount of their tax base and so on and so forth. But at the same time, um, you know, asking kind of broader questions, I think, both from the uh, staff side but also from the political side. One of the other things I worry about a lot um, also is that in general the political leadership in the Silicon Valley um, is two generations older than your typical uh, workforce, per, uh, you know, the workforce that these companies are aiming towards. Um, and so there's also kind of this this kind of disconnect between that. Now, I mean, that's sort of inevitable in the sort of political cycle that we have. Um, but um, I'm not, you know, it, it's, it's one of the challenges, I think, um, in that the political leadership tends to be um, thinking about places like Cupertino or Mountain View um, or Menlo Park in a kind of a way um, of their sort of younger years. And there's a new kind of reality here, which is kind of difficult. You saw this really dramatically in Mountain View when the whole North Bay, what's called the North Bay Shore area, which is where Google is, they did what um, a precise plan, which is more specific than a specific plan. And in the adopted precise plan, there's no housing. There's no housing. They're densifying and there's no housing. That's insane. Um, and it actually became the key issue in last November's election. So there were two, they, they now have a majority of pro-housing people um, on, the, on the city council, but the precise plan was really already adopted. So when Google did its plans for expansion, um, there's no housing in it. Um, because that was the, that was the, the cards that they were dealt. So we'll see how that evolves, um, but um, that was a pretty classic case of people thinking about the kind of segregated, um, you know, auto-oriented land uses that was perfectly appropriate for 1965 and not 2015. When looking at the history of the Bay Area, going back the last 30 or 40 years, there seems, well, statewide, there's a trend of power devolving from central authority to local authority. Yeah. And if you go back to SB 90, SB 45, right. other issues here, Caltrans really need to control 75% of state highway funds. Yeah. And of the remaining 25%, some that's already diverted, spe specified to transit. So the actual part that is decided here at Caltrans is less so. Mm -hmm. And in the most recent version, the uh, State Highway Operations and Protection Program, the SHOP, it's the CTC that's going to hold the greater power uh -huh. there. So you have less so, of a central force. When you go regionally to the Bay Area, there's two important trends, three important trends, really. One is you've got a legislator up in Marin County who wants to take the teeth out of MTC, right. which may or may not happen. But you also have a tradition of all the cities, let's say up and down the peninsula, San Carlos, Burlingame, Belmont, Milbrae, San Bruno, who've always wanted their autonomy. And they're resistant for example, in the plan that MPC put forward regarding housing density. Right. They don't want it. Yeah, the no, city no. itself, San Francisco, yeah. has done more to put on higher density than the, the burbs. Right. And then also, if you look at the transit, it's certainly better than it was, but at one point in the San Jose train station, before it was Deridon train station, there's a sign that said, hey, Amtrak passengers, don't ask us questions at Caltrain and vice versa. <laughs> so there's a history there of intense local autonomy. Right. How do you see a way of not so much creating central authority, but perhaps more cooperation? I mean, um, I, you know, the, the origin of that sort of dispersed authority is that uh, the Bay Area is a really classic, um, what, you know, 
urban geographers call a multinodal metropolitan region. So there was one made, there were two major cities, Oakland and San Francisco, but there were actually a whole, you know, then there was San Jose and then there were all these communities around them. And they didn't, you know, it wasn't that San Francisco grew out, it's that all these other little, all these other cities grew out, right? And then they made one big urban realm. And so the, um, you know, the institutions, the jurisdictional institutions made complete sense in about 1910. Um, so then that asks the question, um, how, do you, uh, how do you rethink that? Um, and nobody likes to give up power. Um, I, I'm very, it's not my issue, but I've been looking at, like, what's going to happen with sea level rise. You know, obviously, it's got to be a coordinated plan to deal with sea level rise, right? Um, and, you know, again, municipalities are really resistant to it. Um, uh, I, 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 I am hoping, um, or I guess that, that um, I see the opportunity of making alliances with people who understand this problem between the public that is more, more interested in not spending two hours on the freeway to and from work and um, this, these this very large new investment by private sector um, to ask, are there new institutional forms of institutional co cooperation? I mean, I don't see any way around that, or we will have a kind of devolving, I mean, we'll have a situation that in 20 years is going to be worse. So, I mean, we have, to me, we have two choices. We can wait till it really gets bad, and then some, you know, we'll do something about it. I mean, we typically do. Really gets bad. But it would be better if we could avoid the really, really bad part and start talking about this now. Um, and um, you know, I one of the places I look for interesting hope is other kinds of institutions that have come together around issues. And one of the places where there's lots of collaboration and cooperation right now are between different water jurisdictions for really obvious reasons. And, um, you know, somehow we all managed to reduce our water consumption by 20% in about seven months, seven or eight months. So it's possible to do that if you begin to sort of, sort of think across um, institutions and engage the public and begin to educate the public. Um, so, um, and there's been lots of collaborative relationship for conjunctive water management or any, a, a number of other things around water, which is seen as very, very critical to lots of private interests, industry and the, obviously the cultural community. Um, to kind of, now it's not perfect and there's lots of issues still remaining, but you see water, um, various water jurisdictions kind of coming together in a, much, under, certainly under a kind of mode of crisis, but they're, they are doing it. So, um, you know, if we had to reinvent it, it would all be much, much better, but we're not going to do that. It's going to be this kind of incremental thing that, you know, a set of jurisdictions get together and realize they're going to have to, they're going to have to solve this together. I mean, I don't, I wish I could kind of have a magic bullet or that it would be some, like, really easy way forward, but it, it isn't. Um, and so, what do you think? <laughs> Okay. What is a strategy for convincing people to, to accept reduced parking ratios, unbundle parking from housing, lowering amount of parking per employee? Um, the best way to do all of those things is show you projects, show people projects where that already works. So that that is. Um, uh, absolutely key. Um, I have a, a, a colleague and friend who has been a affordable housing developer and low income housing developer for 30 years. Um, and he, when he's working in a new jurisdiction, he takes the planning commissioners, the city council, um, and the and the city staff. The first thing he does is he takes them to affordable housing projects that he's proud of um, and that he developed and said, this is what affordable housing looks like. And it's usually completely different than what they thought. So there are projects that do all of these things that are accepting reduced parking ratios, unbundling parking from housing, and lowering the amount of parking employee. And you have to take people to see them and understand how they really, really function. Um, because we already have some examples of that. Um, you're looking at 
sort of geographically how you would want to organize things. And what's your thoughts on the other variables, such as, you know, you mentioned the younger people wanting to move in closer to the urban core, uh, given the state of, you know, when and if they have children, the educational systems here in the state, particularly in the urban area, and also um, small business, when Mm -hmm. you look at our ranking as a state and our friendliness towards small business, we don't do so well. Nope. What's, what's your take on those variables? Yeah. So um, one of the things that um, I didn't specifically mention it, um, but in other talks I have done so, one of the things about equity, it is certainly about um, sort of um, household households who are um, you know less enfranchised than other people. But the other thing about equity that's really important, and one of the reasons why, for instance, the Google buses are really sort of problematic, is that um, it's also about small businesses and um, family-owned businesses and um, that they can't compete in a situation in which there's um, um, in which uh, there aren't services that are equitable across the urban landscape or this and suburban landscape. So I think equity um, has to be considered not only in terms of sort of residential households, but also in terms of businesses. And we don't often think of equity in terms of business, but that's extremely important to me. And um, and in. And, and the kinds of um, urban, you know, uh, the kinds of services we all need, not just urban, you know, wherever we live, the kinds of services we all need cannot be, just be provided by large corporations, right? We, in our daily lives, we use small businesses all the time. We have, we need to, we have to, we want to. Um, so um, thinking about uh, equity in terms of businesses, I think, is extremely important. Um, your um, uh, other question was about um, remind me again. Sorry, um, education. education system. Okay, whether or not the the young youngsters that are so intent on living in the city, whether they get married and then the, they go to the suburbs because that's where the um, well, that's actually an interesting thing because they're going to go to the suburbs. But if they don't really want to live in the suburbs, then I mean, it gives them an opportunity to think about redensifying the suburbs because they will accept a much wider range of housing. Um, and um, uh, in, I mean, the issues around you know inequitable education is something I'm not. I, it's not my area of expertise. I'm going to sort of, I have a terrific colleague named Karen Chappell, and she can talk to you about that in, in great detail. Um, but, um, I mean, I will say this, that if, uh, I, I don't see this as, oh, you're going to live in one place where you're, you're I don't see the kinds of lifestyle trends in these workforces as something that they're only going to do when they're young. That's not where, how it's playing out. Um, it's something that's in the same way that there was this really massive shift to the suburbs in the 1950s and 60s. There's a kind of a really significant shift to living in sort of denser, more urbane situations. And it's kind of larger and generational and more deep-seated than a current choice that's related to age. I would say that. Okay. Okay. Ron, who's a transportation engineer, if the prevalence of private school registration and public school quality seen near the Bay Area business parks does not hold in other regions, what may be added to a new model that develops for the Bay Area to account for how workers seek the best schools elsewhere? So I think we just sort of talked about that. Um, um, and again, I, I think that's a really important piece of the, of the puzzle in terms of thinking about that. Um, but I'm going to... I'm going to, I know a lot of things, but I don't know a whole lot about that one. Any other questions in the room? No, I'm going to. Oh, just one that. Let me see. Okay, sorry. And then I'll. Okay, there's one more here. Thank you. I'm hearing a couple of different dynamics. that you're talking about uh, in the business community, in the corporate world. 
I'm hearing on the one hand, uh, especially at the beginning of your talk, uh, the, the impetus to move out into these suburban areas and create these uh, new um, land uses, if you will, for business purposes and, like you were saying, to capture the employees. Um, and so in that sense, they were being proactive with a very particular business goal in mind. Um, but I'm also hearing on the flip side of it, um, uh, being backed into a corner now and uh, in a way, uh, well, even, even, the, uh, even the model in the 50s, responding to the, uh, not just being proactive, but being reactive to go to where the employees were going out into the suburbs. And now the same kind of thing, being reactive to uh, employees wanting to uh, be urban and urbane and, mm -hmm. in a way, wanting to capture employees in a different kind of way. Right. So uh, there's, t I see a sort of a tension within the business community the way, or the corporate world, the way you've described it. Can you speak to that about whether they're being proactive or reactive or both? Oh, that, I mean, that's a really interesting way. It is an extremely interesting way to kind of couch the, the question. Um, I think that they, uh, I, uh, I think that the Google buses are reactive. <laughs> and I think um, these new mixed-use developments and the attempt at densification and um, land-use diversification and integrating um, transportation is proactive. So I think they are absolutely a combination of, of both. I think that, I mean, I, uh, one of my points is that the, the, these values of the 1950s of, you know, capturing employees and, and, uh, and so forth, um, I mean, that, that those are waning and a new set of values are taking hold um, and that we're in that sort of transitional period right now. And the important thing is to understand that there's a moment when um, people who are more concerned um, about the kind of the larger public good can take advantage of that moment. I think that's the kind of key thing to understand. Hi. Uh, I wanted to get you to elaborate on the um, affordability. You know, we've got uh, $15 minimum wage, still not much, but uh, mm -hmm. double what people have been getting. Right. Is that getting uh, that concept, that, that increased bottom uh, influencing planning much yet for affordability? The increasing uh, minimum um, wage. Yeah. Uh, my understanding, again, this is not completely my area of expertise, for, uh, uh, the uh, change between minimum wage and then uh, affordability. Um, um, my understanding is that um, because of the extraordinary increase in land values in the Bay Area, um, it it has not made a dent because the increase in minimum wage has, you know, has been outpaced by the increase in um, in um, uh, housing costs, um, sort of dramatically. Let's see. I have a, a, a web question, Robert, who's a planner. Um, transit use in the Bay Area is negatively affected by agency fragmentation. Indeed, can we combine small agents to provide coordinated service? Um, uh, as in Boston and New York City? Um, we could. Um, it's a question of political will. And um, I mean, you know, you could very much argue that consolidation may be able to save the state money. And, you know, we're always interested in that sort of thing. Um, um, but um, it would certainly um, uh, work much better. I think there's one last question in the back. One, oh, one last question, our organizer. And then I think we're going to wrap it up. So um, I have heard there are, you know, in the academic world, we have some indexes to measure land use mix. Mm -hmm. And there are some index to or ratios to measure job housing fit. Yep. So do you see some relevance of using those or maybe... Uh, uh, making them more prevalent in making land use decisions or transportation decisions in future? Well, that's actually really interesting. Um, the research center that I um, direct, they're actually, a, uh, we've been sort of trying to work on the inputs on those in indexes. Um, and um, it, uh, I mean, it, what those indexes tr uh, try to offer is that in a situation in which 
municipalities or jurisdictions of any kind are trying to make choices to have some level of predictability in terms of outcome, right? I mean, and that's the, that's the real um, uh, uh, benefit. I think that the, the, there's two things that about those indexes that are really important to understand, or important to uh, refine or think about. Um, one, what's the level of granularity of the inputs? So are you talking, you know, parcel by parcel or, you know, zoning by zoning or, and, and then how does that affect um, the real predictability of those models? Um, and that's a question, I, I, I'm not a really good numbers modeling person, but I know that my colleagues have been asking that question. So how do we put in really good inputs to then be able to make really good um, uh, 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 planning decisions? The other thing is, is that, um, and then if we have those indexes, how are, they, how are they going to then be used? So there's one is about whether or not the indexes are good indicators of future outcomes. And the other one, what are the, you know, how are we going to bind those indexes to some kind of decision-making process? Which I, right now, to me at least, and I can be, um, I can certainly be more informed about this, um, my sense is, is that um, it's, it's, uh, those indexes are in the good to know kind of category, but not integrated into a decision making pro process as clearly or as robustly, shall we say, as um, we would hope, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank our speaker, Louise Mazingo, on behalf of UC Connect and Caltrans. And Katie, would you like to? Okay. Thank you. Oh, I guess I don't need to. Oh, well, okay. Here we go. I'll do it from here. Okay. All right. Well, I did say at the beginning we were going to have a challenging topic here. And I think um, it has been. And thank you so much, Professor Mazingo, for sharing this with us and really uh, bringing home some of the things we need to think about for the future. Um, thank you all for your participation and all your good thoughts and questions. And I know um, this is something that we're all going to give a lot of thought to. Um, I uh, noted that um, you talked about um, looking for the forum to have this discussion and how do we uh, bring in that private sector um, piece to it and maybe some of that investment to the transportation and housing infrastructure that will support livable communities in the peninsula and economic development and in the whole Bay Area. Um, and um, I think that uh, one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, these companies are trying to attract a certain demographic who want to live in the city. So may, is that how we kind of our, way, our area or our topic to get in there? And what is their interest and in how do we talk to them about this? And um, so... Uh, somebody mentioned the Caltrans role and our, um, you know, we don't uh, manage all the funding. We manage certainly a piece of it. And we are very big supporters of regional and metropolitan planning and thinking from our regional blueprint planning days, now SB 375 and the sustainable community strategies and looking um, to um, work with our partners in that area and improve what we do. Um, and uh, we do have um, a, a role definitely in convening and um, talking with our partners, bringing these ideas forward. We also have a role just because we are transportation. And uh, I'm, for instance, I have a um, friend who lives in San Francisco and works in Stanford Research Park, and he says, I think of you every day. Katie, why is my, my, uh, my commute so difficult? And he drives. But why does he, I said, why do you drive? Well, because I get, if I take Caltrain, then I can't get to my office. So there's a lot of things there that, you know, we may not, you know, be the ones in lead on every one of those pieces, but we need to um, help convene the discussion and look at the funding and the coordination and the connectivity um, all over the state uh, that makes our communities more sustainable and livable. And um, 
just uh, gets people out of sitting in traffic. You know, that's not a good livable use of our, um, of our time. So uh, I really um, appreciate uh, Professor Mozingo for being here today. Uh, it, this was um, an excellent presentation, gave us a lot of good thought. I really, I, we have a very cross-functional audience here, our landscape architects, our planners, our traffic operations folks, environmental planners. So I really appreciate um, you all look, um, appreciating the, the need to think about this across all of our functions and sectors. So again, thank you, and let's give a big round of applause for Professor Mozingo. And just a real quick note, our next session of Planning for the 21st Century will be held on October 30th. Um, and we will talk about the role of big data in transportation planning. So we look forward to you all joining us for that as well. Thank you.